Hi, so uh, good evening. I am sorry I'm late. I'll be trying to do this at six and it's, um, it's about ten past six now. Um, but I did it. I'm here and the notes are on Facebook, like just posted them a few seconds ago. So I'm going to get started uh, and um, this will still be available later on and once again I will transition it to um, YouTube. So um, this evening comes out of a conversation last week we were discussing genre and genre and the Gospels and um, I, I hope that was interesting for you. And the question came up, what about the genre of Revelation? So, uh, I thought, how could that possibly go wrong? It'll be fabulous. No one will notice a thing. So, let's have a little look at the genre of uh, the book of Revelation, sometimes called the Revelation to St. John or the Revelation uh, of John um, and kind of like the Gospels the genre nature isn't as clear as you might think uh, now the obvious place to start when you look at Revelation is to look at the genre of apocalyptic literature uh, and in fact apocalyptic literature gets its name from the book of Revelation uh, because if you translate it in Greek as opposed to into English and things like that. Um, but I threw a picture on the notes of Stonehenge because Stonehenge gives its name to the hinge structure, but it's technically not a hinge. So, so although it gave its name to, the, to, to hinges, Stonehenge isn't a hinge. Oh, the things you learn from watching QI. Anyway, so that was, um, so we're going to look at very quickly first at how Revelation is uh, apocalyptic literature. And then I'm going to look at how it isn't. So, uh, how are the similarities? The, the first thing I want to say is, like traditional apocaly apocalyptic literature, it describes the end of a world. Notice I didn't say the end of the world, but the end of a world. Um, and so, an apocalypse is the end of our world, but not always the end of our world. Um, kind of zombie movies, disaster movies, in a sense, are like that. Because you can't imagine after, say, uh, zombies have taken over thousands of people, that the next day the world's going to go back to the way it was. People will survive. There's always some hero, Tom Cruise or someone, who figures it out, and people survive. But the day after is not like the day the virus broke out. Um, or I suspect that when we truly achieve generalized AI, um, I think that's going to be the end of a world. It's going to be the end of a world where an intelligent conversation can only be had with another human being. And there'll be a new partner in intelligent conversations. Uh, and... It's going to change the world. It's going to be the end of one world and the start of a new world. Maybe good, maybe bad, who knows. But it's going to be an apocalypse in that sense. Um, dinosaurs are an example of an apocalyptic event. Um, you know, and the, the, the meteor that hits just off Mexico. Boom. And all the bigger dinosaurs get wiped out. And all we left is with the ones that become birds. Um, that was an apocalypse. It, 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 but it wasn't the end of that world. Um, and of course, uh, the Shoah or, or the uh, Holocaust was, it is, an apocalypse. It just, the world before and the world after are not the same. It's, it's changed the way we see the world. The, the, the inhumanity that, that people can do when they're instructed. Um, and on a more personal level, um, you know, you can have an apocalypse in a, in a home, uh, you know, picture a, a loving family or something like that, and then cancer. And 
it, it, it changes their world. Now, it doesn't change the world, but it changes their world. It's the end of a world. So, in that sense, it's apocalyptic. Um, like most ancient apocalyptic literature, it is socio-political. So, there is a very strong social or political dimension. And when I say that, it's... It's... We, we often think of politics as to be just doing with elected politicians and stuff like that. But it's to do with how we organize ourselves as society. And most apocalyptic, revelations included, uh, was, the, in a sense, the voice of those who didn't have a voice. The voice of the subjugated. So it's sociopolitical. Uh, it has a very strong element. It has very strong supernatural themes normally. So, I mean, if you read Revelations, you have, um, you know, uh, dragons and uh, angelic messengers and, and all these sorts of things. It has that supernatural element in it. Um, and there are symbols, you know, and the symbols correlate. So there are um, dragons and beasts and harlots. Um, and traditionally, the harlot is... Uh, it's a bit of a bad rap. It gets attributed to all sorts of people. Um, you know, and the dragon might be Satan or something. So there's kind of symbol symbolism and numbers and stuff like that. So in that sense, Revelation clearly is apocalyptic. It's different from other apocalyptic literature, however, in a number of ways. It's not anonymous. We know who wrote it. It's a guy called John. Um, and he came from Patmos. And he was writing to some people, and they knew who he was. Um, now, we don't know which John it is, but they knew. He, he's not anonymous. Most uh, apocalyptic literature from about 500 years before Christ, moving forward, has been not anonymous, but pseudonymous. So, uh, let's say Andrew wanted to write an apocalypse. He would attribute it to Moses or Enoch, or Paul, or someone else. Someone long dead, and not to, it wouldn't be attributed to me. Um, the other thing about Revelation is, it, is it, he's writing to a, a, a current audience, current for him, so roughly 2,000 years ago, these seven churches uh, in Asia Minor. Whereas most ancient apocalyptic literature didn't. It, it imagined that, let's say it was Moses, that it was Moses writing to Moses's contemporaries. And so the ancient apocalyptic literature would be then looking forward in time to the time uh, of when it was actually written. So it's kind of like um, going back in time, putting words into Shakespeare's mouth about... Um, the COVID-19 plague of 2020, say. Um, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, but that's not what Revelation does. It is a, it is a current document. It is, yeah, it's not a futurist document. So, um, so it's kind of a, an apocalyptic do document. It's kind of not, even though it's the prototype apocalyptic document. Um, so what are the rules for reading an apocalyptic document? And the first thing to understand is that it's actually speaking into the present circumstance of the writer and usually his audience. So although it's set 300 years into the past or something like that, it's to that present audience. Um, it's just constructed as a for the future. Uh, and so the present audience for, for, um, for, for Revelation is uh, under the Roman Empire. It's an, under a militaristic empire. It's an audience where there is conflict within the church. Um, and there's conflict about within the church theologically, but also in terms of praxis. How do you practice your faith. Uh, and there's a reference to the Nicolaitans, um, who 
appear, but we're not too certain, side note, but you might be interested. So the Nicolaitans appeared to believe that, based on Paul, that uh, no laws mattered, and you could do whatever you wanted. So there was a sort of a, uh, um, a, 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 a free-for-all. That you know, you know when Paul says, should we sin more so that grace may abound more? Their answer was, sure, why not? Hmm, that's a bit of a rough one, but yeah. So, and that, that caused some tension. And so this letter was written into that circumstance. The other thing that it's worth remembering is that it's liturgical. By liturgical, I don't mean it, it was a church thing, although it, it was, we'll come to that. But it reflects kind of a dialogue between heaven and earth. And so these things that happen in heaven are mirrored or, or, or affected by what's happening on earth. It's kind of a, yeah, like I say, and that's a liturgical structure. It's a similar structure that uh, Jews would have been familiar with because they would have been, uh, that, that was the structure of the temple. So think of uh, a temple liturgy. What hap the temple is kind of a, a portal uh, or a mirror of heaven. So there you go. Um, so, so it's kind of apocalyptic in that sense. Th that's how we know it's apocalyptic. Um, it was also a letter. And, and that's important. Um, but, you know, because you have a letter writer, you have an audience, and it's a circular letter. So it's kind of like a letter to the editor, maybe. You want it to be read by your intended audience. Um, but it was in a time when people would read it. But they wouldn't just read it, you know. Uh, they would perform it, almost. Uh, to an audience who were listening. And that might clue you that it was written in a way that would give it urgency and pace so that it was paid attention to. Um, uh, now, remember it was written to an ancient audience. When we read it as scripture, if we read it as if it was written to us now, we are missing a lot of the context. We are missing this idea that it's... Um, that it's an ancient audience. And, and if we think it's written to us now, we're going to blindly skip over some of the work we have to do to try and figure out what it means. Um, but the nice thing is it's a letter, and the end of the letter ends on a positive tone. So um, what that means is that as a kind of a positive overarching structure, it, it sees in some format, a good outcome. Which is interesting when you think of how it's often read as kind of, you know, all these disasters. And it's like, no, 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 it ends on an upbeat note. And in the end, all things come to the good. Um, <laughs> if you manage to pick up the notes, and like I say, I put them up just a few seconds ago, you'll see that there's a little um, tree of life. Because at the end of Revelation, there's the tree of life and the river of life, and there's life and life in abundance. And it's obviously a reference back to Genesis uh, and the tree, uh, the tree of life, the tree of uh, the fruit of knowledge of good and evil and those sorts of things. It's an obvious reference. And I couldn't help it. Um, not long after Darwin published The Origin of the Species, uh, a number of people kind of diagrammed out their understanding of how that tree of life might have gone. Uh, and that one's from 1879. Um, sorry, my notes are on my computer in front of me, so that's what I'm pointing at. Um, that one's from 1879, uh, and it's a very early tree of life. Um, and it looks kind of like a tree, which is cool, because the modern ones just look like a circle with radiating bacteria and stuff, and human beings are just kind of like one teeny tiny little thing. Um, so it's not scientifically accurate, but it's a, it's a, it's a moment just to sort of think about. Um, yeah. Okay. How we go. Okay, done the, done the apoc uh, apocalyptic, done the literature. Okay, so now, John clearly understands this as being a uh, prophetic text. Now, that's unusual because most of the prophetic stuff wasn't text. It was spoken. So, um, you know, Isaiah or someone like that would, have a, would speak, and the speech was the prophecy. But John wrote. Now, that's interesting because it tells you cultures changed. 
you know, um, at the very least 700 years between the prophets and, and John, the, the Old Testament prophets, I guess, if John's a prophet. Um, uh, and so cultures change. The world has shifted. And so prophecy is now that which you are instructed to write down rather than that which you're instructed to proclaim, to say. Um, again, it points to a liturgical context. It points to a church context where people are kind of in the habit, perhaps, of reading in a way that they hadn't been previously, say, during the time of I Isaiah, um, where some could have read, perhaps, but it wasn't a worshipful, it wasn't a thing that was part of worship. Okay. Um, now, prophecy in ancient Israel, uh, what we would call the Old Testament, um, had very little to do with telling the far future. It was primarily focused around expressing how um, God saw the world in that moment um, and giving kind of a warning. If you continue down this path, these are the consequences. If you go down this path, the consequences are less dire. And any kind of um, foretelling the future in that sense was either, you know, if you drive your car off the edge of the cliff, it's going to end badly, or a, a kind of a supernatural knowing so that the message had authority. So, so the, um, yeah, that was how that kind of foretelling the future worked. It was a, It was either partially warning, follow this path, it ends badly, or hopefulness, uh, um, and, and kind of like a stamp, a seal of uh, approval, of authority. Um, in this case, just for fun, it looks like the prophetic message uh, of John in Revelation is, hey guys, I think... What's going to happen is, as a church, we're going to be facing the choice. And the choice is to remain true to the faith and um, be martyred, or to, fa to become apostate, to give up the faith, uh, and then we don't you know, get to go to heaven. Uh, and this was seen almost as a pastorally caring thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's a very different pastoral letter. We should try that sometime these days. See how that goes down. No, um, but that, that was the, the, the threat that John saw coming, that he saw God speaking into. Okay, so there's your kind of three genres, in a sense, that are woven together to make up Revelation. There is apocalyptic literature, the end of a world. There is... Uh, letter writing but kind of global letter writing and there is um and there is that sort of prophetic element to it so mostly it's been read in uh four ways if you will kind of well that's not true it's been read in five or, or more but one of the ways that it's been read is liturgically so it's been read as a, as a as a conversation about church and those sorts of things or perhaps it's been read as re inspiration for art and those sorts of things um, but in terms of how we interpret and understand it let's go with that uh, there have been four options generally um, so the first is called pre preterism or it, basically what it says is these events are all to be interpreted symbolically uh, and essentially they all happened. They'd probably all occurred in various different ways by the time that the canon was closed. Um, so they were, in that sense, very near future uh, foretellings um, with the caveat of the, in the very end, God wins. So... So preterism is it, or pre preterism, uh, you know, is is that um, historic historicism uh, is um, 
it's it's a funny one. Um, <laughs> so um, what that is is people look at Revelation and they get all excited and they go, oh, you know. Um, and the example I've got there is uh, there was this the, the the an oil rig, the Deepwater Horizon, and it was on fire, and it looked like a great big mountain of fire was on top of the ocean. And people said, oh, this is this event, you know, the, the mountain of fire thrown into the ocean in Revelation. It's one of the signs of the end times. Um, uh, and th that kind of thing. And so people look for events in the here and now and they go, that, is, that there, you know, John, John couldn't understand oil rigs on the deep ocean, but he, could, he saw this, uh, God gifted him this sight and, and this is him trying to describe this event. Uh, the fun things is here is when it comes to things like who gets picked as the Antichrist. Um, quite often popes are the Antichrist. Uh, Luther was an Antichrist. Um, Donald Trump's an Antichrist. And interestingly, so was Obama. Uh, a lot of American presidents actually have been uh, tapped as the Antichrist. Um, and um, so we, we, but that's the kind of picture we get where, where people are kind of trying to interpret it for the present uh, day um, with the hope, I guess, that this will allow them to navigate their way through the complexities of the future. Uh, I don't think this is the correct reading, by the way. <laughs> I really don't. Um, and, neither, and neither the next one. So futurism which sees it as prophetic text, um, also has built into it the idea that as prophetic text, it's supposed to be interpreted as literally as possible. Where it says something like, you know, a dragon gets, gives a beast which comes out of the ocean. At some time in the future, uh, according to futurism, there will be a dragon which will give a beast power and this beast will emerge. So all these supernatural elements obviously have not happened. And so it still references an event sometime in the future. So those are roughly the four ways it's been interpreted. Um, I think, look, um, for me, for me, uh, I, I, I think it does need to be um, kind of understood in a sort of a, a preterism manner. It's reflecting the present reality of the author primarily and the, the, the lived hope that in the end um, God's kingdom reigns. And so that's, so, so that's what's going on. In which case, obviously, I don't interpret all those supernatural uh, events, dragons and things like that, um, and harlots beasts as being literal. I do think they describe ancient Rome, not the city of Rome now or the Vatican or any of those sorts of things. I, I believe they describe ancient Rome uh, that was involved at that time in history in actually disrupting the church by trying to convince some of the Christians to live, you know, come on board and you can be Christian and Roman and you can and the author was seeing a, a tension building uh, and was very much concerned by that. So for me, I think the preterism is the, the most useful way. It honors its apocalyptic nature. It honors its prophetic nature because what it says is this, we, we, we are confronted with a choice. We're confronted with a choice to to give in to the Roman power powers um, or to hold firm, first fast to our faith. And it, and, it, and it honors that it's a letter to people who were alive then. But in no way prevents us from looking at some of those same themes and conversations uh, and going, yeah, that that could be be something that we kind of experience now. Um, idealism, I think I skipped that earlier, uh, sort of sees revelation in this same format, which says, you know, this is, we're going to get kind of a, a to and fro, uh, we're going to get an ebbing and flowing of events in the world, 
and these are perhaps uh, symbolic ways of talking about some of those things but we shouldn't necessarily read them as literal so I guess I'd be sort of a combination for myself preterist idealist so that's the genre of Genesis I did come across one thing which I th found fascinating as you read Genesis, there's a lot of kind of conflict and potential concerns, you know. But, as one of the commentators that I read pointed out, nowhere is there a call for Christians or the church to engage in a militant approach. All the uh, action, or violence, violent action, and, and some of it is very violent, is from the heavens, not from the church. Our job is to continue to proclaim our faith in the circumstances where we are, rather than to try and um, uh, bring this stuff about ourselves or, or punish people. So I thought that was a really positive little theme that ran through that I'd never recently. I hope that helps. Um, I'm going to quickly look, see if there are any notes. Uh, I, look, I've been throwing this at you. I've been going really fast. And I've got parish council f fairly shortly. And I think some of you are going to be at parish council. So, <laughs> yay! Um, we'll be fine. Uh, and we'll go from there. Let me just see if I can get to this. Uh, it's supposed to be here somewhere. Where is it? Yeah, there we go. Uh, does the hysteric so uh, does the hystericism advantage feed into the death drive as described by Peter Rowlands? Okay, so um, I um, I don't think so, um, and I would need to do some more thinking about it. So the death drive is our tendency to uh, go for something that would normally be good to an excess to such that it'll kill us. Um, and, and for me, the, the, the picture I kind of think of is, is you know, wealth. Um, where you know, a certain amount of wealth buys you a house and security and food and things like that. But for some people, it just, there's just never enough. Um, or, or, or those people who have the problem where they're always hungry and they'll eat until they're dead. I think the historicism, historicism mm -hmm. approach uh, is more a conversation about um, uh, fear, actually, I think. Uh, fear of the future, desire for control, and in a sense, uh, Gnosticism. The hope to have secret knowledge so that you are set aside from the rest of the world. Um, that would be my uh, reading of the historicis historicism. Fun words, fun language. But thanks for the question. Um, uh, David's saying he'd like more on it. Um, we'll see you yeah, now, um, let's wind that up. And I'll say, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen.